Uh, hi, my name is uh, Kevin Goldstein. I'm going to be talking about building a real-time streaming platform, how to do it uh, easier and better. I'm uh, with Neve Research. Uh, a little bit about our agenda. We want to talk about some uh, the streams, what they are in general as an overview. And then I'm going to talk about what you want in a platform. And then I'm going to talk about a little bit about the advanced requirements. The reason I usually give this stream is I've built a couple of these over the years, or actually a few. Sometimes we roll your own, and sometimes we end up uh, building it using third-party libraries, right? So a little bit about ourselves. Like I said, we're Neve Research. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley, and we've been around since 2008. And since our inception, we've been really, really passionate about high-performance computing. Um, so what I want to start doing now is I'm going to talk about the kind of uh, the kind of streams that you're going to run into in the wild. These are, we have three or four different kinds, and I'm going to talk about them in the order of complexity, right? As we start out, the first thing that we see is we have an inbound stream only. That means that you're having messages coming into your data that needs to be processed, possibly stored, or anything of the sort. A good example of that is climate change, right? A good example of that is, is just storing the, the messages that you're receiving and then putting them into a database later for, for, for mining later. Now, just because you're receiving individual pieces of information and can store it doesn't necessarily mean that this is an easy, easy use case. This is the easiest use case, right? A good example of why this is a complicated use case is because you may end up having to be receiving something like 6 million messages a second if you're dealing from data streams, from, from Opera feed. But based off of the simplicity of this use case, we're going to call this the easiest use case that you can possibly use, right? Um, the next use case is something that where you have only outbound messages, right? So for example, if you're generating, a, a, you have a random number generator, and all of these use cases are things that I've actually built in the past, right? So for, it, for example, if you have a random number generator, and this generator is pu publishing out a number every second, and then suddenly you have, you're, you start doing it for your own clients, and suddenly you have a whole bunch of more interested clients wanting to happen. So you suddenly receive, you know, four or five clients, and then you receive 500 clients, and then you receive 700 clients, then people are using it for timings. And this gets more complicated because the client management aspect of the situation. Do you have to remember who the clients that connected to it previously are? Or do you have to remember which clients um, are, are blah, what clients have connected to it previously are? Do you have to remember what clients are currently connected? And do you have to replay data that missed? between clients that have reconnected and disconnected? Or do you have to uh, just you know, publish out information? Do you have to also have an, an access control list? Do you have to have a control of who's allowed to connect to it? And what kind of different pieces that you're going to be able to allow each client to come into? Right? So this becomes very, very difficult. Uh, it becomes not difficult, but it becomes harder for you to, to end up dealing with. Right? So the next one is going to be a, uh, when you're receiving both messages coming in and out, right? So a good example of this is when you're receiving market data. And that market data is going to be feeding in a basket calculator. Now, what a basket calculator is in this particular instance is most people are going to call it state. Um, state, in this particular instance, a basket calculator, your state, is going to be averages of uh, the telecom stock. So I've got listed up there AT&T, Verizon, uh, Sprint, and T-Mobile US. And it's actually a little bit difficult, it's a little bit harder to be able to do that because you may end up wanting to just average out the prices of, uh, of, of the tickers across the stocks, but you also may want to be using a weighted average cost, right? And some of the previous information feeds to the current information. So it may not just be a simple case of being able to reconstitute your state in the event that, uh, the, the, uh, of a crash, but you have to figure out how you're going to replay that state. And then on top of that, you have that client management system, right? You have to be able to manage three and four and five different clients, or three and four and five hundred different clients. That becomes uh, another aspect that you have to do with. And you also have to be able to do this at scale. You are receiving, in fact, market data. And then on top of that difficulty level, you get the fact that you are, um, that you have to manage state, right? That state, a good example of that is if you're receiving one tick for AT&T and one tick for Verizon, well, your entire state is actually ticked twice now. So that becomes a little difficult, like the fact that you have to, you're publishing out two ticks because you received one tick in each case. And the fact that I've got three different clients connected to it means that I'm actually going to be receiving six ticks, right? And if you throw real numbers at it, if you show, if you realize that AT&T is ticking at 1,500 messages a second and Verizon is ticking at 250 messages a second, that means that you're actually processing 1,750, 1,750 ticks. And if that's going out to the market, because here I'm connected to three uh, people, I'm actually publishing 5,520. 
And that's because I'm only connected to three, three clients, right? This is actually such a complicated process that most large financial companies, like Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, all of the low latency firms, e -trade, e um, eBay, sorry. eBay is a really great case because they, the number of clients that they have is just massive, right? They have their own market data team and group and conveniently called market data team and group. And because of all the stuff that I just talked about, we're going to classify this one as hard. Um, so the next thing that we need to talk about is the actual hardest case of all. And that's where you're receiving a transaction, right? You get a message coming in, uh, an orchestration method, sorry. That's when you receive a transaction where you're receiving a um, message coming into your transaction manager, and you actually have to query out three or four or five different services before you can actually respond to that. Uh, to that original transaction for processing. So you need to actually send out information to different services before you can actually get that back and do something with it. So that becomes very, very difficult, especially in the face that you're going to have to deal with you know, hundreds of thousands of messages a second. Each of these reference data services may have hundreds of thousands of clients, may have tens or 20 of clients. They may have hundreds of thousands of, uh, of state points that they have to maintain as well. So that becomes very, very complicated very, very fast. And because of this, we're going to say, uh, that you're going to have the oh my god hard case. Right? One of the solutions to this situation is the exactly once processing, but this is an oh my god hard case because of all the stuff that I just talked about. Um, so now that we've defined the kinds of streaming applications that you're going to see out in the wild, let's actually talk about some of the properties of the streaming applications that you see. Uh, they usually fall into the category, it's called three Vs, right? Uh, the first one is the volume. That's talking about how much data you're receiving on a per uh, how much data you're receiving on a per service basis, how much data is flowing through your system. That, the good example of that is, you know, you've got weather data coming in from individual readings, which is very, uh, you know, very small amount um, from individual uh, uh, towers, sorry, or you have a massive amount, or you have six million messages coming through your system uh, because you're listening to an options pricing fee, right? So the volume changes quite a bit. The velocity is another question of how fast you can process that those messages, right? Whether or not you can actually process your message um, and the events and information about that message and surrounding it. Because as we've gotten better and better at doing this stuff, we've realized that the data of not just the, the message itself, but the data surrounding that message has suddenly become very important. Then the next thing you want to talk about is the variety. As the, the amount of data that we have to process in the world is increasing, the t different kinds of data that we have to deal with is, is increasing as well. And that means that we have a lot less standardization. That means that we have a lot less uh, structured data that we have to deal with, and we actually have to be able to learn how to ingest and um, process unstructured data. And this is, this is you know, a problem. This is a difficult issue to face. And then later, as we've gotten more and more uh, mature in our, the, the use of our streaming applications, we realize we've got it wrong. The three Vs is, is actually incorrect. We need four Vs, right? The fourth V is veracity. And that is talking about how correct your data is. And this is actually one of the hardest problems that there is because, whoop, I think my, yeah, there it is. This is actually one of the hardest problems that you have, and that's because of, um, you have to be able to ensure your data veracity in flight as you're dealing with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of messages a second, making sure that that customer ID is correct, making sure that that, uh, that, that uh, ticker ID is correct, making sure that it's not a fat finger price, making sure that cell phone is correct. And then that data ends up getting stored, right? That, that data goes into some storage solution that may become later invalid. And that's something that's very, very difficult to deal with and that we end up having to, as an industry, deal with as, as, as an industry end up having to deal with. And Gartner estimates that 70% of our data scientists right now are actually working with unsanitized data. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're re re reconstituting that data from uh, from the data storage, or a lot of it has to do with the fact that your, your, your data is flying so, back, so fast across of your applications and networks that you actually haven't had time to, to check to make sure that that client is indeed that client, or that client is indeed, that, that email is indeed still valid. Because people do move, and people do change their cell phone numbers, and people do change their emails, right? And you have to figure out how to do that. And something else that we've suddenly started realizing is, the time that you access that data, that you process that data, is actually very important as well. A good example of that is like, let's talk about what we expect. And this is the V2I and V2V examples, right? Where it's vehicle to infrastructure and vehicle to vehicles. 
What's happening here is that each car is traveling 60 miles an hour, right? And then they are, they're recording some kind of telemetry. They're recording some fact that they uh, are going you know, 65 miles an hour and they're going in the south direction and they're going on this particular road. And so they know what's going on. And they're marshalling that, that piece of information up and they're sending it to its closest cell network. And that closest cell network is then routing it to its closest fog computing uh, device or edge computing device. And that edge computing device is then routing it to the closest uh, traffic signal. That traffic signal is then going to look around and it's going to see what people are trying to cross the road, or is there somebody, is there an infant problem? They're also going to see uh, how long has it been up and running for, uh, how long has the, the green light been up and running for, how long has the yellow been, uh, red light been up and running for. And they're also going to check with emergency services to see if they need to reroute information, to see if they need to shut down roads and, you know, and, and so that a single, so that a police car or an ambulance can, can blow through only green lights. It's going to look at all of this stuff, image processing, it's going to look at all the data that it's gotten, and it's going to turn around, it's going to make a decision. And then it's going to reply to that decision over the same infrastructure that we received it from. So it, it received it, it's going to send it back over a wired, connect, wired network all the way down to that cell tower. That cell tower is going to translate it into a cell network and that's going back to your car, right? And then if you realize that there's two cars going side by side with each other, and these cars are going 60 miles an hour, right, that these two vehicles need to communicate with each other as well. And another way to say 60 miles an hour is that it's going 88 feet per second. And that's a lot. That's actually really fast, right? At 88 feet per second, um, if you need to take corrective action, if a car is actually uh, go, it starts to drift, drift away, or you need to apply the brakes, or you need to apply you know, anything, that has to happen in a lot less than one second. That has to happen. We're talking milliseconds. We're talking microseconds. And not only that, your devices, they can't slow down. You can't have a pause for one reason or another. And what this basically is telling us is that latency matters. And once you realize that latency matters, you will start paying attention that there's a cost to latency. And you try to figure out how you calculate the cost to latency. And we know that mobile data is somewhere along the lines of 100 times more expensive than other data. right? But when you start thinking about it a little bit more, we realize that expensive is really a multifaceted term. And there's the difference in cost. Right? Of how much does my cell plan cost? Because cars don't communicate with the, the infrastructure of the cars, you know, uh, over the ether. They communicate over a cell network on AT&T and Verizon and things of the sort. So one person may be uh, using a 3G network and another person may be using a 5G network. And one person may, uh, you know, have 10 gigs a month and the other person may have 10 uh, unlimited data a month. And you have to take that into account when you realize what kind of data is going to be publishing information. And then the next thing to realize is that's those same network profiles, something that we've heard a lot about here in the, the IoT conferences, right? The, I, the network profiles determine how long latency or lag is going to take. And like we just said, that this latency and lag, right, this whole thing that takes um, where a car's traveling 88, millis uh, 88 feet in, in, within one second, and that, that latency or lag suddenly becomes critical and quite important. And because you've now decided or you've now had the realization that there's a cost to latency. You suddenly get this evolution of intelligent actors. And intelligent actors are going to be able to, to figure out what kind of data link they're on, what kind of network they're up and running on, right? And they're going to be able to figure out that if I'm on a Wi-Fi network, I can send a lot of information. I can send, you know, the playlist that the car's running and uh, how many people are in the car and things of the sort. But if you're on a cell network, Right? They're going to be sending only telemetry information and, uh, you know, and, and other required information. And that means right, that suddenly you've got a sending strategy evolution and you've got multiple version management. And multiple version management is the bane of the IoT world. You've actually got, if you think about the, the, the evolution of phones, right? I've actually got a friend who still has a StarTac flip phone. <laughs> like, I've got a smartphone. Everybody that I know has a smartphone. They've all got Android phones and everything else. And this guy whaps out his StarTac flip phone, and man, that thing works, right? And so when you talk about technology and the IoT of things, these are people that are going to have to support uh, and maintain stuff long after the technology has not just gotten older, but been decommissioned. If you call up AT&T and you say, hey, can you support a StarTac flip phone, they'll probably ask you what that is. They don't even know, right? So. We not only have to support multiple version management and how we send information, but we also have to be able to do it while doing things at scale. 
Because if you think about how many new devices are coming online at any given moment, that, that's a problem. I, I think I heard somewhere today that they uh, were saying one million sensors, not devices, but uh, one trillion sensors are brought in per year. And you're going to have to be able to scale with those kind of numbers. And the other thing is, if you remember the last, the, the last picture uh, where we're talking about infrastructure, smart infrastructure and smart cities, that means EMT. That means police, firemen, uh, and ambulances. That means that you have to be able to deal with all of this stuff with no downtime. Suffering downtime costs lives. This is, this is an actual problem. <laughs> um, the, next thing that I, the next thing to talk about is, go, go. So one of the reasons they're here, right, is we're exploring some of the difficulties of building stream processing engines, right? So now we want to actually discuss what a stream processing engine absolutely has to have. Right? Well, we know that it has to be performing. We just talked about uh, you got a trillion uh, different sensors coming online. You got 8 billion devices going to 20 billion devices. We know that we're going to have to be able to process anywhere between you know, millions of messages to hundreds of thousands of messages to 10,000s of messages. Right? So we know that performance is an absolute requirement. But we also know that we need to be able to scale that out. And scaling that out being, means many different instances, uh, many different things, depending on how, what your architecture looks like. But you have to be the, run multiple versions. You need to have smart routing. You need to have advanced message routing capabilities. And those advanced message routing capabilities, that, that means a lot. But you need them. You need to be able to send and spe specify, I'm interested in individual components, or I'm interested in sending a, a, a message via a very specific route. So it's not going to pollute the different lines. Right? And an important one is the no data loss. And this is, uh, this is actually one of my uh, the favorite examples. Last Black Friday of Thanksgiving, the one that just, just happened, there was a visa outage for 15 minutes because their system was down. And they were unable to process, I don't know if it was in the United States or if it was worldwide, but visa on the biggest day of the year is suddenly unable to process credit card transactions for 10 to 15 minutes. And what happened to the data that was in flight when that happened? Right? When Visa crashed and you lost all that stuff, was there data lost? Yeah, probably. Was there duplicated message? Yeah, probably. So you need to be able to make sure that whatever messages that you're dealing with, they have no data loss whatsoever. Another real big problem is that it has to be 100% reliable. Now, a good example of this one is uh, we're going back to the EMT. Back in the day, in the late 90s, I, uh, I was friends with uh, somebody who worked for the big telecom industries. And I don't want to say who because I don't want people, them to get mad at me. but. Um, she was telling me, yeah, their client's really mad at her. And I said, why? And I said, well, because we have to shut down emergency services, all emergency services, fire, rescue, uh, ambulances, everything. We have to shut down emergency services for six to eight minutes. OK, why? Well, we're updating a version. And we've got to do a new release. We've got to shut this thing down. We've got to shut it down. All right, well, that's not good. But who's your client, by the way? Australia. Like, not, not the city, not a small city in Australia, which is bad enough, but the continent of Australia has no emergency services shut down for six to eight minutes because they needed to do a version upgrade, right? So whatever it is that you are going to be developing, it has to be 100% reliable. And you have to be able to do version upgrades without shutting the thing down. <laughs> and not only that, today, in today's day and age, when things happen so fast and you've got messages flowing throughout your system and you have some pieces are crashing and some pieces are slow, slowing down and some pieces are behaving exactly what they would need to, you need to be able to have insight into your ecosystem while it's happening. You can't have reports two or three days later saying, oh yeah, by the way, this one microservice is actually having a hard time because it's overloaded or was designed badly. You need to be able to, to like have an insight into your ecosystem right now. And you need to know what kinds of messages are flowing, where the messages are coming from, and who they're going to. The reason the world is moving into this model, the reason the world is moving into this uh, building stream processing, a lot of people are building it themselves, a lot of people are buying it, a lot of people are hacking a little bit of it together, but the reason people are doing it is performance and reliability. You have to have both of those things as an offering if you're going to build your own stream processing engine. Now, the enemies of performance and reliability, things that you just have to take care of, are crashes. And these are not cases of if, these are cases of when you're going to have a crash. And it's hard to think that, oh, well, you know, people don't really write 
processes that crash anymore. And you know, computers don't really crash because you know the old adage of somebody stepped on a power cord. Yeah, everyone laughs because computers are in, are in data centers nowadays, and you don't really step on power cords. Like, well, that's that's partly true, right? And when you're dealing with one computer, the odds of a computer crashing are actually quite low. But man, I've run data centers that have 20,000 computers in them, right? And the odds of not just somebody stepping on a power cord, the odds of your disk filling up, of a network card failing, of a bad DRAM chip coming in, of you know these these are of a fan over uh, failing and suddenly the CPU overheating, right? Like the odds of a computer dying for one reason is not if it's when, and you need to be able to handle that case. Another big problem when you're building stream, uh, stream processing engine or the enemy of reliability performance are black holes. And that means somebody sends a message and that message just goes into a black hole. Like, did, it, did, did, did the person receive it? Ah, we think so. Did it process it? We don't know. Did it receive, like, was there a problem with the, uh, the message? We don't know. Like there was a black hole. It just it went away. Well, that's a problem. You need to be able to address that in whatever solution you provide. Um, and the next one, and this is a big one, because this is something that every single person who tries to write this runs across, is unexplained pauses. And unexplained, and I, I actually have an example at the end of the slide that we'll talk about that, but for a quick example of unexplained pauses, most of the time they come in when you're writing Java processes, and it has to do with memory collection. And from this graph, you can see that memory is getting higher and higher and higher, and you weren't really, you know, uh, tr you weren't really policing the objects that you're creating, and it just drops down to zero. And then it starts building up again and again and again, and it drops down to zero again. And it starts building up again and again and again, and it drops down to zero. Now, aside from the havoc that this writes on memory, right, it also increases the time that it takes for your CPU to run stuff. You're taking away from your algorithm, you're taking away from your process, and you're adding that adage to the CPU to handle memory. That's a problem, right? But you're also adding in a whole boatload of variables that are outside of your system's control. And when you're building these machine, these systems, ah, these critical systems, um, these things have to stay in your control. You need to be able to profile this thing. You need to be able to know exactly what's happening on your system, when it's happening, and why it's happening. And we'll look at one of these examples in a, uh, uh, later on. So let's talk about some of the stuff. I, I said this was the hardest case uh, to build out when, when we're talking about both stream processing and how to how to build applications, right? And one of the reasons that we, these this this case is hard is because people will realize that yeah, you have to have exactly once, and we, we sort of understand that it has to have high availability, and but nobody really thinks about the implications of that, right? What does high availability mean? Well, it means that you have to coordinate this your stream and your state. You have to figure out a good example. You have to figure out how your, how your applications are going to behave if they crash. If they're running in a cluster mode and you have a node that goes away and then a node comes back up, does it have to replay all of its transactions? Does it have to replay all of its messages? Can it start from a clean state, a clean slate of state? <laughs> um, can you reuse events? Now, what happens to the rest of my cluster? Right? I've got to send out a, a publication event saying, hey, 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 I'm coming back up. I'm rejoining the cluster. Does that mean that every other node in that cluster has to stop responding while I reinitialize my state? Well, that's, that's a bad solution too, right? So does that mean that all messages from that cluster get rerouted? And like, it's a very complicated case. And the next problem is what does exactly once mean? Does that exactly once mean the second I finish processing, I updated my state, and I send a message out, do I know that the other person has received it? And do I have to wait until that person has finished processing it as well? Or do I only have to wait until the person acknowledges it? Because if I'm writing this ecosystem and he acknowledges it, but he crashed before he processed it, that's not exactly once. That's sort of he may have gotten it. He may have processed it. He may not have, right? So does that, does that mean that I have to remember this, the messages that I've sent? Does that mean I have to remember all messages that I've ever seen? Because that's a lot of bloody data, right? You have to, suddenly you have to have massive amounts of data to be able to store the message. And if you're storing your message does, on disk, does that mean that your stream processing engine is now running at the speed of disk? Because you just, you just designed the slowest stream processing engine that anybody's ever designed, right? So this becomes a little bit of a problem. And how do you figure out, now that I'm storing the stuff on disk, how do you figure out when you can throw stuff away? Right? How, these are all uh, very difficult problems. Uh, that you need to be able to address as you're building out your stream processing engine. And we also realize, like I said, it has to be highly available. Sorry, the timing's got a little bit messed up. 
So again, if we go back to that, oh my God, hard solution, if we look, go back to what this thing really needs to look like when you're designing a system, let's say, for example, we have this transaction processor, and I'm just going to throw out some theoretical examples where I'm processing transaction, and I want to make sure that um, the customer, the product, and the, uh, the user of it are all a part of my reference data systems. And it means that I have to have different reference data systems. So as I receive, number, as I receive message coming into number one, right, I need to send these out to clusters two, three, and four. But you need to make sure that cluster one can suffer an outage while processing. And you need to make sure that while processing two, cluster four can, send an, can, can suffer an outage as well. And I can still continue to do my job. In fact, part the way the world is going, the way of keeping data in motion, you have to suffer darn near catastrophic failure on your systems. Right? This is a system that I've actually designed and worked on that we're up and running, where we lost half of our processing power and the system continued operating nominally. It continued servicing the client, it continued servicing the messages, it continued doing everything that you're supposed to do because we built it in a highly available mode. And then people will look at this picture and say, well, you can't do this at scale. It's almost impossible for you to design this particular system and actually process stuff within uh, you know, the SLAs that you say you, uh, that we require. And I say that's not true. In the, the use case that I'm talking about, right, we had over 200 refer reference data engines for every single transaction piece coming in. And we were processing tens of thousands of messages per second in the low millisecond response times, right, without outliers solving all of our SLAs down to the four nines. 99.999% of the time, we were within our SLAs, right? And that's because we're able to process things in this high availability mode, and that's because you're able to deploy things on, uh, on a multi-cluster basis. Now, some of the biggest problems that you're gonna run in to people when they're doing highly available mode is that they'll make host A, C, and E the same guy. So you've got all your primaries running on one host and all your backups running on another host. And suddenly, if you lose a box because your fans slowed down, or you lose a box because somebody stepped on a power cord, or you lose a box, you suddenly lost all primary workings. So you didn't just suffer catastrophic failure, you suffered catastrophic failure at the exact same time, right? So there have been uh, techniques that have evolved over time that allow you to not suffer catastrophic failure, that allow you to do, instead of working on two, on two hosts, you put it on four. You know, preferably you'd like it on eight, but you know, hardware is expensive. Running things in the cloud is expensive. So you can, do, you can mitigate a lot of these responses um, in order to, to continue working with this stuff. Another problem, oops, sorry. So one of the service, oh, this is a good one. I like this. This is one of the examples uh, that I was talking about previously. This is a separate example. One of our clients had actually asked us to build them to come and look at their credit card processing system. And uh, we went in and they basically had this credit card processing um, system that dealt in a serial manner where you're receiving messages. It's going from credit card master. Uh, it's doing some lookup on a table. It's then processing it. It's slapping that lookup into a table and then, then passing it to the merchant. And then the merchant reads the result of the previous result, it does some more processing, it does some stuff, and it slaps that into a database as well. And then it passes it on to the credit card holder, so on and so forth, until it replies with a yay or nay result, right? And this was really pushing the bounds of their uh, SLAs in order to meet what their, clients, what their clients needed, so they asked us to take a look at it. And we took one look at the serial process and we said, hey, um, <laughs> we said, hey, this is ripe for microservices approach in conjunction with high availability and in conjunction with the streaming data, right? So this is your big data, fast data in motion flowing at the same time. And one of the things uh, that's important to note about this is that each of these groups is scaled out on a separate process. Whereas before, if you're talking about a serial or monolithic system, you basically are passing, this is the information that you got, and you may massage it this way or that way, but you're passing it between functions, or you're passing it between modules, and this is the best thing that you can do, and this whole module is taking up one large computer, uh, and it is what it is. Well, in this case, right, each of these things is broken out, and they're scaled out by only the information that they need, and they're only receiving the information that they need. And that means that our credit card master module, for example, 
can have five instances. And our merchant master module, for example, and these, these numbers are true, had 25 instances. And our credit card holder ma module, for example, had three instances. And you need to be able to have these things running in high availability cluster mode as well. So not only are you running your credit card master in a, in a, ah, ah, Sorry, your credit card master in a cluster, but each of those and each of those separate shards in that cluster has to be running in high availability mode so that you can you can suffer any of these particular failures. Now, the next thing that you need to be able to do is because you've got this advanced routing met, met, uh, methodology that I spoke of, right? You can suddenly parallelize this. And once you've parallelized it, it means that the response time for your system has gone from the sum of all of your microservices. It's not, it used to be, I was, how long did it take to do the credit card master, plus how long did it take to do the merchant master, plus how long did it take to do the credit card holder, to now, which, whichever one was the slowest one is how slow your system responded. And sometimes those, those slow ones will change and they'll get better. Um, but either way, you've increased the speed by orders of magnitude because you're able to process these things in parallel instead of being able to process them in serial. Another big thing that we talked about was the requirements of having advanced message routing capabilities, right? And once you have advanced message routing capabilities, once you can change the routes of messages on the fly, without having to build your system out from scratch, without having to shut everybody down and bring it back up, means that you can add on new components dynamically. This is actually one of our favorite things from our Wall Street customers, right? You want to be able to try out a new algo? Hey, plug that sucker in and turn it on for one ticker and see how it goes. Did you miss any edge cases? Is it performing the way that you expected it to perform? Um, and yo, it's working for one ticker? T scale that thing up for five tickers. Scale that thing up for 10 tickers. You don't have to harden that thing to production, right? You can see how it's performing and you can do research to see how your systems are performing because I'm able to knock things in to production, uh, because I'm able to lock components into production dynamically. That means that you have incremental release and testing. And by the way, the reverse is also true too. You have decremental release and testing. It may be that it's time you, one of your components is now old and you need to, uh, you're, you're deprecating it. Like you're, you're not gonna support StarTAC phones anymore, right? You can route traffic away from that dynamically and then knock that thing down after you've verified that zero messages have gone through it in the last month. Right? This ability to do uh, advanced routing is very, very important. Um, another very important part of what, if you're going to be building any stream processing engine, is si ecosystem inspection and stats. And the, the good example that I like to use is Amazon, Amazon.com. They know when something is becoming a trending topic before it's a trending topic, before it's on the front page of CNN. They know, oh, somebody's really liking this dollhouse right, before the front page of CNN published a uh, published this thing that people bought 600 dollhouses by accident. Right? They're able to have that inspection into their system because they have an uh, ecosystem inspection and stats. And that ecosystem inspection and stats talks about what services are up and running, which services are running slow, what kinds of messages are flowing through your system. In short, what you really want to do is you want to be able to profile your entire ecosystem dynamically. And you want to be able to do it very, very fast. You want to be able to start out from a large view and you want to be able to zoom in to the small view um, in, in a matter of seconds. Not only that, these, the larger the system becomes, the harder this gets, as well as the maintenance of your ecosystem. In that example where I said, listen, we've got our, one of our clients is, has over 200 different reference data engines. Great, they're all running in primary and backup mode. That means they've got 400 pieces of, of software that are deployed. And, and there's more on top of that. The primary and backup mode, and there's different shards. There's actually something like 1,200 microservices that are up and running, right? So you, need, you want to be able to profile what messages are flying throughout your system on 1,200 different pieces of software. You need to have that capability, and you need to have the capability of what kinds of messages, not just who they're going to, but where they're coming from and whether or not this makes sense. Suddenly, I went from buying 100, uh, uh, I went from buying 100 shares of Microsoft every five minutes to people are sending 100,000 messages of 100 shares of Microsoft, Microsoft in the last five seconds. 
This is a perfectly valid flow of the system, but man, somebody better stop, jump up, say risk and compliance needs to get in control. I think something somewhere has gone wrong. Either there's a hostile takeover or an algo has gone wrong or something is going on, but this is not normal behavior, even though the message flow through your system is normal. You need to be able to see what's going on in your system. And this is actually another, uh, oh, and this goes back to, so not only do you want to profile your ecosystem, you want to be able to zoom in very, very quickly into individual components within your system. Um, okay. So a good example of this is I've got, uh, I've got the same, I wrote the same application for, uh, as an example here, and I did it one with garbage collection and one with zero garbage collection, right? And so what we're seeing here is the garbage collection behavior. And you see that we're receiving just under 4,000 messages a second. Um, I don't really like the fact that it's not this beautiful, smooth line. Uh, don't necessarily know if that's wrong. I do know that I wrote this with, with garbage collection enabled, so okay, that sort of jives with what I'm seeing, but let me inspect a little bit more what's happening inside that particular service, right? So I suddenly look at what's happening in my heat memory, and I suddenly see this ugly bandsaw. It is going up, it is going down, it is going up, it is going down. Okay, and not only that, I, later, I noticed later in life, right, that it jumped up a little line or two. So not only is there a lot of, Java, is there a lot of garbage collection going on, it appear, apparently there's a memory leak. <laughs> So this becomes a little bit of a challenge because not as, as writers of your own stream processing engine, you have to make sure that you've got your own garbage collection under control because users are going to have garbage collection as well, right? I'm the user of the system in, in this particular case. So here's the question. I suddenly see this uh, heap memory usage, and I say, all right, well, let's have a look what's going on at the, jar, at the Java garbage collector, and I see, oh, there's actually quite a lot going on at the Java, Java garbage collection, right? This, I, uh, I sort of feel that this may be performing badly on my system. So let's look at the, uh, at the rates on my system. And if I look here at the bottom of the median, my median rate is running at nine microseconds. That's a pretty darn good rate for being able to process. That is, that is low latency. We say we're a low latency shop. Uh, nine microseconds for processing a message is low latency. Problem solved. The problem is when you look at the max. And the max is 167 milliseconds. And you can look at that graph and you see that the 167 milliseconds off the tail end of it, right? That's almost double of another spike, but fine. Let's take the smaller spike. Let's not take the 167 millisecond spike. Let's take the 90th millisecond spike or the 90 millisecond spike, right? That's still what four orders of magnitude larger than my average processing time, which is nine microseconds. And if I call a microsecond a second, then my average processing time is happening in nine seconds. So I send a request, I click buy on Amazon, uh, Amazon cart, and nine seconds later it comes back and says, who, you, you, you bought that dollhouse, you're good to go. Whereas if you compare that 167 or that 90 milliseconds, that's 2.5 hours later. I clicked that thing and 2.5 hours later came in and this is because I wasn't policing my objects. I wasn't policing what's happening inside my system, and I wasn't policing what's happening inside my streaming, uh, my streaming engine. Now, if we look at the exact same thing, so here's the next one. So this is garbage free, and I'm still not too happy with this, but we've got a we've got a pretty good rate. Like it said, just under 4K, exactly like the previous one, and I still I still see spikes. Well, all right, I'm not too happy there, but let's let's continue down our investigation. And um, if we end up seeing, we look at the Java memory heap usage. Well, all right, well, there's no memory heap usage. That means, okay, I'm indeed using a garbage-free memory heap. Okay, now, how does this look in my Java garbage collector? Well, there's zero garbage collectors. That right there makes me uh, suspicious. What do you mean there's no zero garbage collections? I don't necessarily believe that. But I'm gonna go look at the message processing times, right, and I look at my median. I say, hey, my median is nine microseconds. My max is at 22 microseconds because I started paying attention to my Java garbage collection, because I started paying attention to how I allocate objects and how I distribute objects, right? And because of this, because of that zero garbage collection entries right there, that zero uh, GCs, is the reason I like to show these two side by side because most people get very suspicious when you see zero. And so, at, I see there's a lot, of, um, a lot of noise, so I took, the, I took the liberty of redacting 
stuff in the middle. I took the liberty of just placing black bars in between uh, runs. As, and as you can see, the profile, as far as messages per second are running, are exactly the same. You see that large spike going up, right? And that's when I'm warming up my JVM. That's when I send out 10,000 messages just to make sure, hey, I've allocated the memory I need to allocate. I've done whatever it is I'm going to do. And it comes up and it comes right back down. And you'll see that in both runs, it, it behaves exactly the same. It allocates your memory and it allocates everything it needs to do. And then it comes back down and it starts running at this constant just under 4K. Uh, for under just under this 4k rate but if you look to the right hand side right you see that the java memory heap usage on one is this ugly bandsaw plus the memory leak that i pointed out earlier to the one next to it and that's flat and if you look beneath it at your memory heap allocation rate you see that one is actually uh performing at just above 50 megabytes per second and the other one's performing at zero. And if you look beneath that, you see the, uh, sorry, to the right of that, you see the garbage collection, a whole bunch of ugly garbage collection spikes on the bottom versus zero on the other one. And if you look beneath that one as well, the messaging rates are exactly the same. And so the question is, what did I change on this? I stopped using Google Proto Buffer, and I started using a zero garbage streaming process that I, that I was able to build on my own, right? Garbage collection and these pauses, these unexplained pauses are the absolute bane of the IoT world. Um, I think that brings me to the end of the presentation. Does anybody have any questions?